I appreciate the uh, invitation and um, and certainly I'm excited about this paper, which really was just e-published last week. So it is hyper recent. Um, and as uh, Rupert mentioned, as an anesthesiologist, I use ketamine, midazolam, you know, as well as other anesthetic agents, uh, but really feel like the neuroscience underlying the uh, brain effects are, are less well um, characterized than they could be. And so that's the line of research that I've been uh, pursuing alongside my clinical practice. So I'm delighted that this is uh, this work is reaching not only an international audience, but a cross-disciplinary one too. So I'm excited to present uh, with all of you today. So this work was funded by a grant from FAIR, which is a US-based foundation that funds uh, anesthesia research and junior investigators like myself. As you can guess by the title of the grant here, we had pretty focused hypotheses on how uh, these two agents would differentially modulate the hippocampal and amygdalar um, learning systems. The one being uh, more, you know, uh, more associated with explicit memory in general, and the other with fear learning or um, classical conditioning. And so, realizing that the journal club's focus is mostly on ketamine, that's the results from the paper that we'll hone in on with a little bit of the midazolam results um, sprinkled in. It's it was a randomized within subject uh, crossover trial, and so. They, uh, the subjects as they entered essentially were assigned to a drug order, either getting ketamine first or midazolam first, and then after an uh, explicit period of at least three days, they came back for the other um, drug uh, in, a, in the experimental paradigm that I'll go over. Uh, I will say that the average time was more like a couple of weeks, and at the far end, it was more like a couple of months for a few subjects. And not all of them, of course, came back for their second session, so about two-thirds of the data uh, is based on first sessions with either drug uh, and another third with the follow-ups um, that were able to complete both. The, we did exclude any uh, psychoactive medication use or any psychiatric diagnosis. So those with diagnosed anxiety or depression, or even those that maybe were on like an SSRI or uh, medicines for ADHD weren't able to participate. This was just to assure a homogeneous uh, sample of subjects. So the Experiment itself, and this is a portion of figure two from the paper, involves subjects listening to a series of spoken words. And these were relatively short recordings. Um, they then were asked to respond to a categorization decision um, task. And so for each word they thought about, for example, can it move or not? And then answered yes or no by pushing a button with their uh, right hand uh, index or middle finger. Importantly, a third of these was immediately followed by one second long painful stimulation. And this was done with an electric nerve stimulator connected to their left index finger. And we had pre-titrated the current level in advance to what they subjectively rated to be uh, seven out of 10 pain. And so that was kept constant throughout the experiment um, in terms of the amount of current delivered, even though their rating may change um, you know, at later points. The um, and so this was essentially a combined pain plus uh, memory encoding task, uh, but certainly the entire experiment, even though a third of the items were directly followed by painful stimulation, it creates this threatening environment where they know that um, periodically and at some point in the future, they're going to receive that painful stimulation again. So this was done under a saline control condition and then um, after an appropriate period of time to allow the drug to reach steady state, uh, we repeated the same experimental um, conditions, except with different words under the influence of the drug. And uh, we did achieve a light level of sedation. So with literally both agents, uh, all subjects were able to follow uh, verbal commands and respond, albeit a little bit slower uh, once they were under the influence of the medications. We did fMRI scanning during both segments. You can see some of the key imaging parameters listed there. And the whole goal really being to compare both the imaging results and the behavioral findings between these two segments, um, saline and between the both of the drugs um, averaging across subjects. So I wanted to provide a little bit more detail than uh, what was in the paper about the dosing, particularly of ketamine. And so this is an example of the sort of regimen that we might use. Um, I, I modeled this on an actual one of our subjects, which was a 90 kilogram uh, female. And you can see it's a, it's a bolus followed by an infusion sort of strategy. And if we plot the effect site concentration over time, it looks something like this. And our target concentration for ketamine was 200 nanograms per ml. Uh, 
And you can see really after about um, 10 minutes, kind of taking that little time point uh, shown by the corner of the box, it reaches a steady state of excite concentration, which we can then maintain for really as long as we want. But in this case, the experiment takes about 35 or 40 minutes. And we do that by just slowly decreasing the concentration over time to sort of match their metabolism and excretion. And then when it's time, we turn off the infusion um, and let them recover. So the um, drug dose information is in table one in the paper, but I've uh, summarized it here with a little more, um, I guess, granularity about the maximum and minimum, for example. And you can see these are clinically meaningful doses of ketamine that they're receiving. Now, admittedly, it's over a period of 40 minutes, so it's a little different than getting a bolus dose of approximately 50 milligrams for our largest subjects. And you can see there's quite a wide range, um, you know, almost twofold difference in the total dose, and that's in part because we have a wide range of sizes of subjects uh, too, going from 50 to say 90 kilos. And so the pharmacokinetic models used account for um, sex as well as age, and then um, their height and their uh, weight as well to get a real sense of what, um, at least to the best that we can model, what the uh, drug effects should be. The um, <clears throat> interesting, just to, I'll mention as an aside, since you guys um, you know, can get a little more uh, insight into the paper, I hadn't initially included this, uh, nor really tabulated it, but it was requested by the reviewers in one of the rounds of revision uh, to get more of a quantitative assessment of what the different side effects were with the two drugs. And you can see, um, this is included, I think, in the text of the paper, but just tabulating them here, you know, side effects were more common with ketamine, and certainly things we wouldn't really expect with midazolam, like uh, feeling that dysphoria or dissociation, nausea, and then the um, side effects of nystagmus causing a few to report blurred vision or double vision. Uh, and, and I guess I should clarify, these were obtained um, every time we pause the scanner, so between those three repetition blocks during the drug infusion, but by free report. So we didn't have a checklist to ask for these. These were just um, things that the subjects volunteered when we sort of asked them how they're doing, how they're feeling. The, uh, and then the next piece, which was performed the following uh, day, was a memory testing uh, portion. And so they heard all of the same words. And so there's 90 that would have come from the saline segment, 90 from the drug segment. And thus we added in an equal number of words that they didn't hear during the experiment. These were again presented uh, through headphones and so an auditory route of delivery. And they were asked to, in this case, uh, mark whether or not they recognized the word. And they had two different levels uh, at which they could acknowledge that they recognized it. The first. Uh, being what we call a remember response. And we explained this to them in detail in advance, that this would indicate that they recollected specific details about hearing the word during the experiment. So um, if they had thought really hard about whether this thing can move or not, for example, uh, and they remembered some of those different thought processes, that would be a specific um, detail. Similarly, if they remembered very specifically that the word was uh, maybe something a little more associated with pain. For example, um, our word bank includes a handful of weapons. Uh, they might think, oh, I remember that association and I got shocked afterwards. And any of those sort of details would be fine uh, to indicate that it was a recollective or a remember response. If they otherwise thought that the word was familiar and they, they sort of recognized it, but didn't recall any specific details, they could mark uh, the no response. And otherwise they should indicate that it was new. And so this <clears throat> allows us to differentiate um, and uh, with math that I won't present here unless anyone's interested, you can convert their memory performance score into this standardized metric called D prime, which is to some extent in standard deviation units. And so you can think of uh, a value of two as being two standard deviations of performance above chance, which would be a D prime of zero, meaning that they marked just as many items wrong that they thought they heard the day before, but they actually didn't as they identified correctly. And uh, we have it broken down here. This is taken from figure four panel B from the paper where we've summarized uh, and aggregated across pain pairing and just looking at the difference between the recollection and familiarity components of explicit memory. And the, the real take home is that it was significantly reduced for recollection by midazolam. Although ketamine has um, an on average lower value than under saline, there, uh, the difference wasn't statistically significant between saline and ketamine, uh, but midazolam was significantly lower. And this is 
consistent with what we would expect uh, based on its amnestic properties. And uh, I'll just point out there was no difference between familiarity responses, which doesn't necessarily mean that recollection, uh, which represents a higher, deeper level of encoding, uh, was the only thing impaired, but rather that some words were shifted into uh, familiarity and then some other words that would have otherwise been familiar, you know, under saline conditions were probably forgotten altogether under the influence of either drug. So we also um, collected and analyzed the response time data, and this is included in uh, figure three, I believe, in the paper. And the real take home here is that there weren't significant differences uh, between either drug or really even between the drugs and saline, uh, which allow us to have a semi-quantitative uh, assessment that at least the psychomotor responses were similar um, between the two drug conditions. And uh, that coupled with our observation that they were able to follow commands um, is why we sort of conclude that we're at roughly equal levels of sedation with the two. They certainly differed in their behavioral effects. And as we talked about already, uh, recollection was significantly decreased under midazolam, not so much under ketamine, although I did uh, include the sort of non-significant uh, but average decrease uh, under that drug. And then consistent with we, its known analgesic properties, ketamine did reduce pain scores from our, our targeted starting value of about seven to really five on average. Um, just as an aside, and I, I think you can tease this out from um, the table in the paper, there were, was wide variability in the uh, response across subjects in terms of how their uh, pain was mm -hmm. relieved, some getting uh, not so much and others getting it down to a score of one or two. Okay, and then <laughs> moving into the at least uh, more colorful and, and for me, you know, the more interesting um, albeit uh, more complicated uh, results for the functional imaging. So this is looking at uh, task-related fMRI activation, and this is figure adapted at least from figure five in the paper for uh, analyzed specifically for items that were recognized as familiar. And this was chosen to be the one presented in the main portion of the paper because it gave the best representative sampling across the different um, brain areas that sort of lined up with our uh, hypotheses related to memory, fear learning, and then pain processing. And so I've color coded them here. Uh, I'm I'm sure uh, those that are that work in neuroscience will immediately recognize that you know there's no um, clear delineation for some of these brain regions. You know the anterior cingulate, for example, certainly plays a role in pain processing as well, and is commonly activated in those um, sorts of tasks. We see other areas like uh, somatosensory areas that would be non-specifically activated both to pain and other um, tasks. And, um, and then as you can see, some default mode areas actually showed a relative deactivation to task uh, here in the precuneus and posterior cingulate. Um, and then association areas in the, in the parietal cortex and then more um, you know, executive or um, uh, cognitive processing areas in the prefrontal cortex seem to come up with, with the task as well. We can compare that, at least visually, to the average results under ketamine. And the, the one caveat here is that this is not a direct statistical comparison of the activation under the two conditions. And so although ketamine visually shows less overall activation, that could be less brain activity or it could be increased noise uh, in the data set. And so this, uh, as I hopefully have you know, uh, tried to be explicit about in the paper too, isn't necessarily definitive. But um, for both ketamine and really midazolam, the, the overall um, gestalt, at least, is that there's less activation able to be detected under the two drugs in, in roughly the same brain areas um, that we saw activation under saline. And then included as uh, supplementary digital content, I, I did analyze the data for just the recollected items. And uh, sort of paradoxically, areas like uh, the hippocampus and parahippocampus, which were activated in the familiarity um, maps, uh, didn't light up here. Probably because um, this represented words that they remembered really well, and so maybe didn't have to work as hard or engage as many brain resources to encode. Uh, and there's, particularly under the um, two drug conditions, there are fewer ob observations um, available as well because there were fewer items recollected. And then finally, this uh, last map that just popped up uh, here at somewhat accidentally shows the task-related activation just for pain-paired items, regardless of whether they were recollected or recognized as familiar. And you can see, interestingly, um, just by performing the task, the uh, memory 
areas of the brain in the parahippocampus and hippocampus were engaged, and it seems as if there's a um, uh, deactivation during uh, the experience of pain and that doing that encoding process. Um, again, this is just looking at the 30 items that were associated with pain in either condition, but not um, necessarily splitting the data based on whether it was remembered or not. And uh, certainly we see a little bit more robust activation of some of the somatosensory processing areas and even the supplementary motor area here. And that persists with the caveat that I mentioned about this not being a direct comparison in the ketamine data too. So despite it having an analgesic effect uh, under, um, under ketamine, you can see areas of um, uh, somatosensory or pain matrix activation do still uh, persist in the average ketamine maps. So then the second real fun, uh, fundamental imaging finding is uh, to do functional connectivity. And we did not employ a separate resting state um, scan, but rather took the data during the task acquisition, carefully regressed out the timing of all of the task events, and essentially are looking at background connectivity during the periodic experience of pain, as well as during performance of this task uh, that I previously mentioned. And we employed um, software called CON, or for the Functional Connectivity Toolbox, which was developed by a couple of groups out of uh, Boston here in the last decade or so, and employed a seed to voxel methodology such that regions uh, the brain of the brain, as defined by the Harvard-Oxford Atlas, which divides it up into about 105 different regions. You can see over on the right, uh, a really cool image uh, I just found on the Khan website uh, yesterday that has them labeled and everything. Uh, but I wanted to point out, we, we chose this in part because um, the regions we were most interested in, like the amygdala and hippocampus shown there in the box, could be used as the seed region, thus averaging all of the signals within, for example, the amygdala, and then looking throughout the brain for possible targets. And so a small cluster of activation in the anterior cingulate, like just where I'm showing with the pointer, could be detected as significantly um, um, showing a change in connectivity without the entire uh, ACC volume having to be correlated. And so that, uh, because it's a relatively unconstrained analysis, so the targets are throughout the brain, uh, it sets up a really hard thing to show uh, visually. Uh, we did focus on some predetermined areas for the seed regions, and you can see them listed here. They're areas that we knew uh, could have involvement in either pain processing, memory formation, or fear learning. And uh, we also included the two major ones from the posterior portions of the default mode network, as we thought this might be engaged as su uh, subjects. Attention shifted as a result of the task. And this is the more detailed, granular um, way the results um, you know, come out of the CON software. So this is a sample taken from the complete list, which is in supplementary digital content two, and looking just at the example from the right hippocampus for ketamine specifically, we can see that there were, uh, in this case, decreases in connectivity from the right hippocampus to, for example, both the right and left primary somatosensory cortex. And so uh, what I've done in the summary tables, which are included in the paper, is kind of blend across both the laterality and the anterior posterior delineations, uh, like for example, the anterior posterior portions of the hippocampus. And in doing so, we can get a higher level view of what major changes in connectivity are going on. And this, <coughs> they, um, the editorial office apparently didn't like my color coding because this didn't make it into the final table, but I had um, formatted them such that you could see decreases in connectivity under drug in blue and increases in red. And what we um, see right away, this is the table for ketamine, is that predominantly the decrease, the functional connectivity changes were decreased. And this spans a bunch of different areas that, um, you know, from our predetermined seed regions across different networks. And, you know, the anterior cingulate, as I mentioned, can play a role in both pain processing and fear response. Uh, and so that's, we've included this little more broad label here, and it showed increase in connectivity to two different targets in the prefrontal cortices uh, and a decrease in connectivity to the supplementary motor area, for example. We can see different changes um, for the amygdala to both somatosensory and motor um, targets. And then uh, uh, quite a few different clusters of connectivity change from seeds in the hippocampus and parahippocampus that cross um, not only into somatosensory or motor processing areas, but also um, you know, areas throughout the 
frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes, um, all of these having decreased connectivity under ketamine. And uh, just for, um, I guess, a broad level summary, then, you know, my takeaway from this is there's cross network decreases in connectivity that are happening. And then quickly, just for comparison, this would be table three from the paper is the results from midazolam. And the major theme there is that the connectivity was actually predominantly increased, uh, again, during task performance and with periodic painful stimulation, and, uh, but under midazolam, the opposite direction was seen. And that, with that, uh, we'll certainly open it for questions. And I've also included my email there, and I think it's in the um, event information as well. If anyone has any questions further down the road or doesn't get a chance to ask them during the uh, Q&A session or is listening to this uh, later in time. So thanks. Keith, that's a really impressive piece of work and just so clearly um, <clears throat> set out. Thank you very much. Um, there are some, some bits there that... Um, uh, I think uh, would be good to just try and take a step back and, and maybe if uh, um, some of us who are less familiar with the um, uh, with all the with the imaging um, uh, to to sort of take a look at but the thing that the thing that just jumped out at me as a as a, as a, as a job in psychiatrist really was this um, increase in the uh, functional connectivity between the anterior cingulate and the prefrontal cortex in the ketamine condition. Um, me, yeah, the, the slide back, before that one. Back, back up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and I, you know, I, when I when I see a talk like this, I'm always trying to think: what does this mean clinically? What does it mean to my patients? You know, and could can I just sort of tempt you to speculate on what that what that might mean <laughs> well um let me uh, give you my personal bias first and then uh, and then i'll try to answer your question and that is that a lot of these areas although we see them you know light up with different tasks and so you know a common one i feel like is um that there's a hippocampal to dorsolateral prefrontal um you know connection or or collaboration between those two areas that's responsible for explicit memory signature. And uh, if you look at all of, if you do the reverse though, and look at what all the things that the, the ventrum, you know, or sorry, the dorsal, uh, dorsal medial um, um, prefrontal cortex does, it's, it's such a wide variety of um, tasks. And so these areas I think are engaged differentially based on the situation. And, you know, perhaps even um, we are limited by the, the gross um, both spatial and temporal sampling that we're doing and so you know the brain communicates on a, a level of sophistication that isn't really captured by this one second temporal resolution um, but having said that it, it's probably connections between regions that um, largely explain uh, behavior and by that i mean like state of consciousness and or you know ability to form memories um, if we look, and there's converging literature in the anesthesiology world that it's really loss of long range functional connectivity that characterize the loss of consciousness under a variety of agents, whether it be ketamine or an inhaled uh, anesthetic gas or, or you know, some other agent like um, propofol, which is one of our commonly used IV anesthetics, uh, which similar to midazolam is, um, you know, a GABA agonist. So you know, the anterior cingulate is, is one of those other interesting areas. So we see it light up in um, attention sort of tasks. Uh, I'm speaking a little bit, you know, out of my uh, normal area there, but it's definitely in concert with the amygdala involved in fear learning and, uh, and in pain processing. And so if we take in those things together, it's probably involved in an attentional shift or, um, you know, in the attention to new information or perhaps uh, attention away from an aversive stimulus. And, you know, in co it cooperates, I'm sure, with prefrontal targets. And, you know, to say whether orbital frontal versus ventral medial in this case uh, means something um, specific would be hard for me to ascertain. And I'll also mention, I, I don't have the um, table handy, uh, 
but again, there could well have been a sort of like leftward um, interior cingulate um, um, uh, versus a, you know, two different targets in the orbital frontal cortex that have both been blended into this, um, this single row in the table. So in some cases, there's multiple prefrontal targets, I guess, that were identified. But as long as the change in connectivity was in the same uh, direction, we've, I've sort of summarized it here like this. Here, I don't know if you were wondering too, and I I, I had a backup slide in for this too. Um, there, oh, but go ahead, go ahead. Right, so I want I want to leave time for other questions too. Let's see that. Let's see the backup slide. Well, I was going to say, if you're wondering why I don't have one of these cool like grids of oh, here's the connectivity from region A to region B, um, and you can do this with this data, but the the problem is you're you're constraining the analysis to um, very broad areas. And so unless all of this on average, um, you know, is correlated to your seed region, you'll, you'll miss something. And so if you, and actually, if you try to calculate this for ketamine, the map is even sparser and there's like very few areas. And so our, uh, you know, technique of using the um, a seed to voxel analysis is more sensitive for small clusters of activation that may be within a subset of, for example, the anterior cingulate or a subset of the prefrontal cortex. But it does make it harder to display the results because the options are almost endless. It could be anywhere in the brain um, and it could be any number of combination of voxels and it could even span across those um, ROIs that you've used as the seed regions. Okay, um, we've got a, a question here from Doug Lira who says, what are the implications of your ketamine versus midazolam findings? with respect to the use of midazolam as a control condition in ketamine RCTs. That's the sort of, uh, that's, that's our bread and butter of this, this sort of community is. Well, <laughs> yeah, let me say when, when uh, I think Sarah mentioned this in an email as we were sort of discussing putting this together, I was a little bit surprised uh, to hear that it's sort of an active uh, placebo, if you will, in some of the trials. Um, I, they have, you know, and I intentionally chose the drugs because they're so different, uh, at least for both the way we use them, the indications in the anesthesiology world, but also yeah, not only their uh, receptor pharmacology, but their clinical effects. If we think about the neuroscience, you know, ketamine, it just broadly is more excitatory uh, and, and the Dazlam being more sedative, right? Um, so I, I, I don't have enough background to comment on the sort of appropriateness of, of comparing those two. Um, but, but I think they complement each other well, and I don't know if this is done in some of the uh, psychiatric work too, but, um, we commonly in the anesthesia world will use midazolam to smooth out some of the side effects of, of ketamine. So it, it, it was a common mantra, actually, that you give like a little bit of midazolam first, um, you get the benefits from, uh, from both, uh, without, uh, having some of the same, uh, difficulties with the unpleasant or dysphoric side effects that can creep up with ketamine. Okay. So, um, it is, you know, ketamine at really high doses is a general anesthetic and, um, uh, you know, it tends to, while preserving respiration, interestingly, um, and probably increasing secretions and some other sort of off-target effects, uh, makes people, uh, you know, completely insensate to very painful stimulus. Um, but the way it's commonly used in anesthesia practice, um, nowadays is at lower doses, like on the order of 20 or 30 milligrams, similar to what we had in this study as an adjunct to general anesthesia, predominantly for post-op pain benefits. And, um, you know, with the goal, per particularly because of the, um, you know, problems that we've run into with opioids of, you know, many varieties, including respiratory depression acutely, and even addiction um, in the longer term setting, it's used as an opioid sparing analgesic. And, um, there's, there's a lot of other, um, emerging, I guess, um, what we call multimodal, you know, things we can use for pain control. Um, but most of them don't work great, you know, so we have Tylenol and things like that, for example, but the efficacy of uh, ketamine at relieving pain, even at low dose, uh, tends to be better than a lot of those, um, agents. And, you know, I'll just mention there's a, in our, in the same journal, I think actually anesthesiology, there was a study looking at methadone. IV, you know, used acutely for pain control and ketamine in combination, showing there's actually synergistic uh, benefit of using the two together. And uh, methadone's another 
um, drug, at least in, in the U.S. and in, in my practice um, as an OR anesthesiologist, that is um, it wasn't commonly uh, being used 10 or 15 years ago, but is becoming increasingly um, widespread. And um, although it's you know just just like anything, I guess a little bit of a dirty drug, uh, it has some NMDA uh, antagonism. And um, we get benefits, I think, from that polypharmacy when, when used at lower doses and in combination with other agents. Um, so anyway, that's my sort of personal experience with, um, with using ketamine. I'd be interested to hear other questions or comments.